My name is Eric Johnson. Uh, I am senior uh, technology editor with the Journal of Commerce. We are a part of IHS Market. Um, I'm in the maritime and trade uh, division within IHS Market, and my primary role is to research and write about uh, logistics technology. Uh, we we cover uh, all modes of tech, uh, all modes of freight and logistics, global trade. Uh, my job is to help primarily shippers across all verticals understand better how technology is kind of intersecting with their daily operations and how they should strategize around um, incorporating technology, uh, you know, with, with all the mandates that are sort of, we've, that have been laid out over the last uh, two days. Um, we're gonna look really kind of narrowly today within uh, kind of the logistics and supply chain uh, fields. So that incorporates, as John said, um, cargo transportation across modes, and also uh, contract logistics or warehousing. Um, obviously, critical pieces of any uh, industrial company's uh, operations. So, with no further ado, I, I, I have some uh, a couple thoughts that I'll uh, kind of set the stage for our discussion. Uh, but we have lots to discuss today, and not not a whole lot of time, and, and a great panel of experts. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves because they can do that a lot better than I can. But to my le immediate left is uh, Eric uh, Klein with Crux Systems, uh, Drew McElroy with Transfix, Fergo Glenn with Six River Systems, and Tommy Barnes with Project 44. Um, Tommy, why don't you kick us off on the far end? Sure, good morning. <coughs> Thanks to the exchange for having us. Uh, great show over the last couple days. Uh, we're happy to be here. Uh, Tommy Barnes, I'm the president of Project 44 uh, Enterprise we're an enterprise SaaS supply chain platform based in Chicago. And uh, thanks for having us today, and what a great panel. So we should enjoy the next couple, next hour or so. Fergal? Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming in this morning. My name is Fergal Glynn, and I'm v VP of Marketing at Six River Systems. We are building a new way of doing warehouse automation and fulfillment powered by a collaborative robot, which we call Chuck. Chuck is right outside the door, so when you go for coffee after the session, please stop by. Um, also, a big thank you to the Industrial Exchange team for having us here. Um, so our company, we, we're working with 3PLs, we're working with industrial companies. Some of our customers include XPO, DHL, Lockheed Martin, and looking forward to having a good discussion with the panel here today. True. Good morning, everybody. My name is Drew McElroy. I'm the founder and CEO of Transfix. Uh, so Transfix is a, is a digital freight broker, uh, which is to say we execute uh, truckloads on behalf of our customers. Um, and we do this uh, applying all sorts of fun, buzzwordy technologies. We, we deploy mobile technology to our drivers. Uh, and ultimately, our value creation is based in uh, driving utilization to uh, trucks and to ultimately to truck drivers. Uh, and a lot of that efficiency is created through uh, effective matching uh, of truck and load, and we deploy, like I say, all sorts of uh, fun buzzwords to get there. AI and ML and big data and all that good stuff. Um, we're based in New York City. Uh, there's about 175 of us. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to raise about $80 million in capital. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Eric Klein, CEO and co-founder for Crux Systems. We are a uh, SaaS platform that provides ocean visibility for all cargo going into North America, irrespective of carrier or port. Uh, the idea being, you know, we normalize the data, we clean the data, we identify choke points, problems all ahead of time so that our predominant customers of BCOs like Gap Inc. or 3PLs or like Kuninagel Expeditors and Flexport are able to like better manage their cargo and also get that data to where they need it to be, uh, whether it's in-house or to other third-party systems. Great. Um, so a variety of different technology <coughs> providers covering different facets of the logistics um, puzzle, and it is a puzzle. So <laughs> let me set the stage here and sort of posit something that you guys can all chime in on. Um, we've heard a lot over the last couple of days about uh, the imperatives that are facing industrial companies and, and, and uh, the private equity companies that own them. Uh, a lot of, it, it's my view, and I, I'm interested to hear your, through your experience that uh, pre, so we, we came in the 90s out of a sort of a post, an ERP-led era where industrial companies, large enterprises, 
spend a lot of money kind of on their own internal systems, not customer facing systems. Amazon comes on the scene and changes that over the course of 15 years, changes that whole scenario. And now there's this imperative to invest in customer facing systems. How do we, how, how is what you, or what you guys are doing changing the, that in, environment back to focusing a little bit more on the B2B uh, scenario? So in other words, how has the uh, Amazon's kind of customer facing technology focus trickled down to kind of a B2B scenario? Am I, am I wrong on, on that theory and, and you know, sort of how should the companies in the audience think about what they need to invest in from a B2B Listen, perspective? Listen, think about how we collectively interact with technology today as consumers. Think about that. We, I myself, you know, order 15 to 20 times a week uh, via Amazon, either Prime Now or Prime, whatever it may be, for a variety of things. Some of those may be commodities. And what I've seen happen, the team here can, can chime in too, is change the whole B2B perspective of the expectation of how we service uh, our internal and external customers. Yep. So to me, it's become a definitive uh, for technology, a tailwind to be able to push it along, to be to force us all to be more innovative. Because uh, again, what we expect is not what we expected um, 10, 15 years ago. I'm an older guy now. I'm getting to be one of the old guys in the, in the industry, and, and, <coughs> and I'm. <laughs> and, and again, I'm telling you how I look at things. So I understand that even if you go even deeper to the younger generations, they have the same expectations as well. That's my my uh, my thoughts on kind of what we're seeing trend-wise. Yeah. I think a good example is like what our customer center Tire did that we talked about. Uh, they're uh, you know a top 50 tire company here in uh, the Miami area. Main factories in Thailand. Their logistics managers were you know having the common problem of like where's my stuff. But ultimately, right, they're selling to their end customers like tire discounters and a number of other tire distributors, and that customers who really needed visibility on where were their orders. And so we had done an integration with not just their logistics group, but with the sales arm to get integrated to salesforce.com so that that customer's customers were able to get the same level of visibility that their logistics managers were getting so that they could you know, not just improve visibility, but decrease the customer churn mm -hmm. on where is my stuff, what's happening to it. Yeah. I, I personally think there's, there's probably at least two things at play here, right? I mean, I, obviously Amazon is, is pushing, but I, I don't know that Amazon is necessarily uh, the actual spark that created this. I think some of this is just the natural flow of the business cycle. I mean, if you think of the, the, the 90s and into the early 2000s, um, I would say collectively that we were very, very focused on manufacturing. Things like Lean and Kaizen and, and the Toyota production system and all those things forced anyone who's in the manufacturing game to the, to the point where if you're not really, really good at manufacturing, that's table stakes now. And so, you know, we can sit back and say, okay, we've got the manufacturing component like pretty well, uh, pretty efficient. But if the Venus system, if the supply chain doesn't allow you to get the output of that manufacturing where it needs to be, when it needs to be there in an efficient way, what have you really done? So it, to me, it seems like a, a logical next step after, you know, really focusing on manufacturing to focus on what, what, what ultimately delivers those goods to market, the next step, which is the supply chain. And if you combine that with mobile technology and, and the, the, the consumer expectations that have been driven by mobile technology, you've now got this very potent brew where B2B companies are, are thinking like consumers. Um, and that, that obviously manifests itself both in terms of the, the expectations, uh, but frankly also, I mean, even little things. I mean, you mentioned you know, ERPs and things like that. Like yeah. if you look at a, a modern SaaS-based ERP and you compare that to a legacy system, I mean, just the, the ease of use, just from like a UI, UX perspective, uh, companies are realizing that, that, that consumers are used to this now and those consumers just come to work and they don't want to look at crappy software when they can look at beautiful software in their personal lives. So I think that, that kind of combination of, of, of forces has really driven expectations up. And now, of course, with Amazon able to, frankly, subsidize delivery costs to, to further torture retailers, uh, I, don't, I don't see this stopping particularly anytime soon. Right. Just to like, add on a small bit to that, like, especially around like, the Amazon points and also around supply chain and technology, with, which this panel is about. So a lot of companies, when they've been looking at and trying to do like, fulfillment and send bigger items, get them out the door faster, they've been throwing a lot of people at the problem. But then if we look at what Amazon did, so Amazon, they bought a 
robotic system called Kiva 10 years ago, and they took it off the market, and now it's rebranded as Amazon Robotics. Now, Amazon as well are saying that, yes, we have to go hire hundreds of thousands of people for our warehouse, like the re warehouses. The reality is they probably won't get to that number of new hires, but they do have this technology infrastructure that is helping them get orders out the door faster. And kind of when, when, we, when we think about what's going on in getting our products into a warehouse, storing them in the warehouse and getting them out of the warehouse, about 70% of that cost is on labor. And about 70% of your people's time is just spent walking around. So Amazon have figured that piece out. And like, that's one of the things that we're working very hard on is to provide affordable automation to all the companies in the world, not just the biggest, but mid-market, small companies, where they too can get the benefits that Amazon are getting from where you've got the people that are in the building, you're getting them to be the most productive that they could possibly be. Accomplish more with less automation. resources, yeah. I like, I like the way you put that, affordable automation. And, and, Thank you. Yeah, I like the way you put that. Yeah. So let's drill down a little bit into um, you know the, the, the types of companies um, at this event, because you guys all juggle uh, customers across different verticals. So what separates uh, industrial customers from you know, retail customers or some other customers that you may have? What, wh how are their needs different from a technology usage and consumption perspective? Well, the, the, the biggest difference to me between retail and industrial is for the most part, retail, uh, we're either picking up from their vendors and bringing it to them or bringing it from them to their own stores. So it's a bit of a closed loop and you know, they have their own set of expectations. But when you work with a, <clears throat> a manufacturing company, of course, by and large, you're delivering to their customers. And so there's, there can be a direct and material impact <clears throat> on, on your own you know, top line and otherwise success as a business if you can't put the widgets on their dock when they're supposed to get the widgets. Um, and so you know, I, I wouldn't say that it's more important for an industrial company because it's certainly important for a retailer too, but uh, I, I think it's, it is that much more critical when your supply chain or your, your partners are directly touching your customers. There's that much more both opportunity if you do it right and there's that much more risk if you, if you don't. So in other words, a retail, that closed loop, you can kind of shield some of the, the shortfalls of a system a little bit more effectively than if you're d delivering to yeah, a Yeah, I, I, like I say, I think it's a, it's a, different, it's a different perspective on things. You know, if, you, if you're, if the, whatever, right? If the, if the load of Cheetos is late by a day to the DC, it may not be the end of the world, right? You know, we've probably got enough safety stock in the network and things like that, that like deliver it tomorrow morning and it'll probably be okay. Right. But, if you're delivering to your customer, amongst other things, you don't even have the luxury of making that call. That's on your customer. And right. we all know, it, even if it's not that big of a deal to the customer, they still might tell you it's that big of a deal because it's just another point of leverage. Uh, and again, it goes vice versa. If, you're, if your performance is stellar and you can you know, compare yourself uh, favorably to other vendors, that just puts you in that much you know, stronger of a position. So combination of, of, of making the customers happy and then of course doing so in an efficient way. I mean, if you make the customers happy by carrying a ridiculous amount of inventory and you know, using the wrong mode and things like that, well that's kind of defeating the purpose because you're gonna, you're gonna spend so much money that you're not gonna actually get that positive return. So if you can be efficient and, and stellar, uh, that to me is a competitive differentiator. Hmm. Anyone else? Well, no, he said it, he said it well. It's, uh, it's more of an external customer focus and an internal customer uh, focus that you're going to have. And kind of a, what I call a more to clear definitive cost to serve and how you can view that based on the uh, uh, cleanliness of, of that is more of a pure kind of a one-way network in a lot of ways. But uh, I think that this, the same problems or opportunities exist in those networks that a lot of the retailers see as well. Mm -hmm. Again, to me, you know, a lot of the companies that are here, you know, I, we talk about technology and these guys all know it well. It's an enable to a better process, as we all know. And the hard part about this is change management, how we change and embrace change uh, with technology around our supply chain themselves. <coughs> and a lot of this comes down to how flexible and nimble can we be. And Eric, we've thought this before, a lot of the companies that are here have you know, massive old deployments of systems and things of that in, that in nature. Uh, what's cool about today's world, you can kind of leapfrog over, I believe now, to a different platform and kind of get out of that proverbial spaghetti bowl that you get into, especially when you're acquiring companies that have multiple ERP systems. Mm -hmm. So we're in a new era now today. I think that we need to embrace. I'm 
I'm not usually hard to hear, but uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, those are those are my comments. But yes, Drew, Drew said it well. Yeah. Well, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was. Gonna, I mean, there's there's obviously differences in amplitude as far as impacts of disruption, but I mean, the common thread, irrespective, is know about a disruption as early as possible so that I either can work towards you know, diverting it or resolving that disruption that hasn't happened but will, uh, or taking some other kind of corrective action or communication, uh, both internally and externally. I mean, we, we, we see it with another customer like Michelin where their material flow into their factories in Greenville are extremely important, right. but are the railroads going to be on time? Is the ship going to be on time? I mean, those are all variables that are completely out, outside of their control. Some may even argue outside of the steamship line's control. Uh, but knowing those disruptions as early as possible is just as critical. This is, this is real life, right? And tens and thousands of miles of, of oceans and roads and all sorts of crazy things, things are going to happen. But it seems to me like one of the themes that well, all of our companies, with maybe the exception of uh, on the hardware side, but certainly on, on a on platform side, one of the, th the themes that the three of us always talk about is, is visibility, right? If you, don't, if you don't know where things are and what's happening with them, there's no way you're going to be able to deal with it. And if yeah, I mean, if the, if the truck or the ship bursts into flames, I mean, that's going to be a problem whether you know it or not. But, but still, being able to get out in front of it and know what's happening and, and proactively deal with things and proactively alert your customer as opposed to the sort of like black hole that, that, that historically exists where you don't know there's a problem until the delivery is missed and now everyone's already pissed off. Uh, it's a pretty big difference between proactive and reactive. So Eric, just um, like kind of going back to the question as well, where we started with B two B, B two C. Like whether whether you're a B two B company or B two C company, your buyers they have a choice. So you have to be competitive, no matter what vertical, no matter who your customer is today. Like you, you have to uh, like focus on your differentiators. You have to focus on just being competitive. And one of the things that we're seeing in, in the B2B world and how uh, people are thinking about purchasing whether it's services or products, they're, they're taking what they're used to from the B2C world, where in the B2C world, we're used to paying for services, for example, by the month. Like we're used to ordering, paying, and consuming services on, on an on-demand basis. And so like if we back up a few years, many years now, like we saw that Computing power, for an example, was when there was mainframes. That was just available to only the largest companies in the world. And then along came the PC, along came cloud computing, where now it leveled the playing field. And so just as we've seen the playing field get leveled in computing power, we're also seeing it getting leveled across um, for operators in the supply chain. Like whether they're looking to purchase hardware or whether they're looking to purchase software, there's now providers that can take what used to be a multi-million dollar monolithic investment and just break that down into services that that operator can, again, purchase, order, consume, and purchase on an unneeded basis. Yep. Yeah, that's a great example of how that, that B2C mentality is, has percolated into a B2B environment. Um, I, I, I think that the, uh, you know, we, we've heard a lot about in the last couple of days about companies struggling with, under the weight of the systems that, they, that they've been operating and whether that's inhibiting their growth. And, and we've also talked about how you know, portfolios can be better kind of integrated within, uh, within each other and, and taking advantage of kind of common systems. What's powering that is exactly what Fergal said. Modern software architecture now is such that you don't need a consultant to come in for six months and help you implement it. You can literally in some cases, turn it on. Well, I'd argue the fact that, uh, that, again, like I said previously, the companies that have less technology will actually get ahead now because they can leapfrog. Yeah. I think the companies that have a lot of, especially through acquisition, when they acquire different ERP platforms, TMS platforms, you have to unwind all that. Yeah. And I think that's the hardest part. But I, I think we're in, a, in an era now where we can literally kind of jump ahead. Uh, quick question. I don't want to hijack the panel. Yeah, no. I want to ask the group out here. How many uh, BCOs do we have in the room, shippers? How many are awake from? How many people were awake from last some, night? Some people might not even know this. <laughs> Actually, yeah. seriously. Well, I asked the question because I always, I always have to fi figure out who is, um, who sees supply chain as a strategic um, arm or advantage to their company, and then follow-up question would be, how do you see technology really enabling that? 
And that really drives the whole discussion because we don't want to be a solution looking for a problem. You want to find a way to, to, to help drive and enable people. So. Yeah. Well, so, I, and, and maybe I'd ask you guys to think about some, maybe now some specific examples where to, to sort of double down on this idea of the e more easily, easily adoptable technology, because every single industrial company has some system that they wish that they didn't have or they wish could be updated, yep. Yep. but they can't get rid of it. So how some of the things that you guys are working on are based on you know, APIs and, and you know, modular kind of design of software. How, are, how would a company go about you know, incorporating what you do with you know, these sort of legacy systems um, and, and any tan, you know, specific examples you can provide would be helpful, I think. It's, it's tough, right? <laughs> I mean, you gotta, I mean, I hate to, what I would say is most companies today have some means of integration or integration layer. Um, I'll use MuleSoft, most of you know MuleSoft as an example, where they can actually take a company uh, like Eric's team or Drew's team and pull that into the integration layer and easily integrate that. Yep. Uh, go back 10 years ago, as you guys all know, that wasn't really possible. Right. So to me, we have a, a good opportunity to pull things in quickly and then integrate those, even if they're legacy systems. You know, a lot of companies that still have the old AS400 applications, but they can pull in new APIs and, and um, uh, new types of organizations through the integration layer. That gives them an advantage more than they had 10 years ago. That's my editorial, and I think these guys are good examples of that. Yeah, I was going to say, some of our biggest examples of you know, very old school legacy systems running on some IBM AS, you know, 400 old server, you know, trying to work on those guys to actually do a proper integration would be like pulling teeth and cost, you know, a huge amount of money. And, and what we set out to build was do that with no effort on anybody's part, either find a way to do it automatically or, you know, the users have lots of ways of getting data out. So just handle whatever format that is and then provide the data back to them in a way that's not so much focused on getting it back into that AS400 uh, server, but make it in their web app or put it into some other system that, that they're using. So um, that is kind of like the power of the you know, more modern systems like us is, is we can be a lot more flexible, but also show that they can use a system independently yep. of, of other systems. Our, our story is maybe a little bit different because we're, we're of course not in the business of, of selling software. We're in the business of selling service that is highly enabled by software. Um, and so um, the reality is as a service company, um, we, are, we exist in service of our customers. And by and large, these are very large enterprises, even medium-sized enterprises, but, but large companies. And the reality is they're often stuck. Uh, and so our job, if we're doing it properly, we talk about keeping the, the, the communications aperture as wide as possible. So yes, some of our more sophisticated customers have either developed their own API or they've started working with other visibility partners like some of the folks on stage and we can integrate with them and, and do it really quickly. But the reality is that's not often the case. I mean, most companies are still using EDI as a data exchange protocol or Something else, right? I mean, APIs are, are, are rare still. I mean, getting better, but, but still rare. For and some, so, for some people, EDI is still aspirational. Right, right. So. Exactly my point, which is, yeah, which is fine. Like, I mean, the reality is everybody, the vast majority of people, are trying to do the best that they can. And, and sometimes you inherit a, a mess and you're like, I'm trying to fix it. And yes, I wish I was on an API, but today I'm not, and this is the reality I have to deal with. And our job is to have a solution for you. And, and one of the, the great things about, about what we do, Ultimately, the reason you raise venture capital, right, is to make investments in the business. So we get to say things to our customers like, yeah, this is a mess, but give us what we need and we will do it on your behalf. And that's an investment in that customer and also an investment in our business. Because you know, after you've integrated with every van or whatever on the planet, it's just something that happens more quickly. And that's just, that's just competitive moat at that point. So uh, you, you, our job as a service provider is to is to make it work. Yeah. Like, uh, legacy systems as well, they're just a fact of life and they're, they're not going to go away until for the operator in that company, until the economics makes sense. Right. But whether it's APIs or EDI, what I would encourage the operator, uh, operators in the audience to do is kind of going back to what I said about small services and thinking in more of an agile manner. So like, yes, you do have your legacy system and yes, that is powering a big chunk of your business, but what are the add-ons? 
What are those microservices? What are these agile projects where there is an EDI or API available for you to, for that new system to be able to talk to your legacy system? And you know, most of the supply chain companies, technology companies that are out there, like we are building all those interfaces so that our customers are able to talk between what we provide and their legacy system. So it's like, I don't think it's, it's an excuse. I think for the operator, it's like you should still always be looking at the economics of what you have. And then like, what are those low cost kind of high reward bets that you can put in to improve what you have? Well, and, and you know, the, I did a demo with Fergal's uh, robot. You know, you can apply that to the physical space too. You're, you talked about a, a warehouse that is old and antiquated. You can put a, you know, a modern piece of machinery into it that, that not only you know, automates a lot of the work that a human does, but it also provides better data around that. So there, yep. there, it's, it's not just you know, zeros and ones. It's, it's actual physical automation as well, right? Yeah, no, no, like I, I, you're, you're dead right with that. It's the same kind of analogy that, yeah, on, you might have mainframe, and so we just talked about the software side, but yeah, you could have, you could have an old building, and, but the economics don't make sense yet to move or to get rid of that building. And so like, what can you do then within that building to extend the lifespan? What can you do in there to just help with the overall ROI? And there, there's a lot of options in today's world. Well, let's stay on that topic of hardware a little bit. Um, one of the big developments in kind of this fourth industrial revolution uh, broad topic is uh, sensors and Internet of Things, the idea that literally every single physical object will be trackable and how, what do you do to, with all the data that those things generate? Um, is, it, is it financially practical for organizations to invest in these types of things? Who bears the cost of, of the infrastructure for this? Um, I'll start with you, Fergal. What, yep. what, can we talk about like where the costs are on some of these things? Um, you obviously have a warehouse piece of hardware to sell, but there's also things down to like almost invisible microchips in the you know the fabric in my shirt that are theoretically possible, right? Yeah, so our, our company, we, we build hardware that hardware is powered by software, software that's on that robotic device in the warehouse, but also software that's in the cloud. Yep. And there's kind of, in terms of our supply chain, like a, a lot of our supply chain, whether it's hardware or software, it's, it's off the shelf components, it's off the shelf um, software. There's kind of three main areas that we look at. So we, we look at the, the sensors, we look at open source, and we look at artificial intelligence and cloud computing. And across those three areas, we're seeing more availability, we're seeing the cost drop, and we're seeing, particularly on the sensor and hardware side, that those objects are getting smaller and smaller. And like just like a couple of pointed examples on, on the open source side. So, we have the benefit that our company was set up just three years ago, but before our company was set up, these great people, they took an open, they created this open source project called the robotic operating system. And we were able to leverage that in the early days. And so when we look back to when we started the company, for example, for us to write a obstacle avoidance library, this is just back three years ago, it would have taken us three to four months. Mm. Now, just with the advances in libraries that are Plug available, APIs that are available, we can write a new obstacle avoidance library in a matter of hours or days. On the computing side in the cloud, 10 years ago, the cost of a teraflop was over 40 bucks. Now it's in, it's in the pennies to be able to get access to that. So we're, you know, we're, we're all fortunate that, I believe we're fortunate that we're in this great time now where we're coming to market and we're, we're kind of riding on the heels of these great advances in reduction in cost and hardware, mm -hmm. sensors getting smaller, more available, and just computing power. I, I talked already about that kind of playing field being leveled and whether you're the largest company in the world or um, relatively smaller companies, particularly like our company, you've got access, you've got access to all those capabilities. Open source, I'm glad you brought that up just to divert to that quickly. That to me has been one of the more interesting developments in the last few years uh, from a supply chain perspective, because I think 
for most companies, th think of their supply chain as very proprietary, very private, very, you know, uh, your data is close to your chest, your solutions are close to your chest. We've seen, I've seen a proliferation of, of either open source or uh, uh, ambition to, to drive open source kind of approaches to things. We even had a, a TMS provider, a transportation management system provider earlier this week, had a, a developer conference, a DevCon at their event, which was like, which is absolutely unheard of really uh, in, our, in the transportation industry. So, but um, yeah, anyone with any other thoughts on the cost of, of kind of hardware that's associated? We, you guys are all interested in visibility of in-transit cargo. What, what is? Well, the, only, the only thing is like, yeah, the, the cost of sensors and hardware is just going down and down and down. And, and I mean, I've lost track of the number of different sensor companies that you know, have their new idea about how, how, how that will revolutionize logistics and transportation. I mean, the reality is like, there's lots of really good niches and, Fit for purpose sensors that you know serve whether it's a re refrigerated cargo or whether it's a high value retail cargo it doesn't really matter. I mean, for our, from our <coughs> perspective, is how can you enable all of them? Whether they're either a microservice that that's you know fit for purpose on this specific type of cargo, uh, but if we can backhaul that and get it back into their ERP, then we're able to enable that. I, I think what's cool is the the reduction in cost um, allows. So many more, so many more bets, or so many more people to, to try and see if it works. I mean, 10, 15 years ago, if you wanted to, to yeah. start a startup, you need, I mean, what, a, at least a couple of million bucks in capital because the first thing you had to do was build out, you know, servers and build out your physical infrastructure. I mean, even just the cloud alone. Now, spin it up on AWS. Let's go. And you know, with 500k, we can take a shot at this for six months. And if it gets traction, then we'll know. And if it doesn't, then you know, we'll go do something else. Mm -hmm. But that that opportunity didn't. The, the capital efficiency has gotten so much better with the with the proliferation of, of both open source and the cloud and, and everything else. It's to me, it's uh, it's fascinating. And and what that ultimately means is the more, you know, it's just survival of the fittest, right? And the more, the more, the more turtles that hatch on the beach running toward the water, like, the, the more likely some are going to survive. And that, that just means that, you know, we're going to move forward. There's, there's your image to take. A bunch of <laughs> startup turtles running toward the beach. Um, but I, I think it also, like, this matters for all of our customers that yeah. now you're not forced into, like, a big, huge waterfall project. Like, now you can yeah. kind of operate in this agile manner where you pick and choose yeah. projects yeah. that, you know, you can deploy really, really quick. I mean, we, we literally talk to our customers. Again, it's, we're a little different because we're not, like, a full software layer. But it comes down to, listen, like, are, is the value prop that we're describing compelling to you? Well, if so, the, the risk of experimenting with it is, is so small. I mean, unless you think we're going to take your product and like abscond to Tijuana, like the, the reality is nothing bad is going to happen by you sticking your toe in the water. And then if, if I'm right and the ROI is there, well, now you've got this pilot and then we can talk about a lot more things. That, that is, you know, I, I think a much better, you know, the try before you buy is a, is a better way to go about things than like this massive CapEx thing that we've got ourselves involved in and now, oh no, it sucks and we can't back our way out. That's a, that would be, that would be unfortunate. You, you even see industrial, uh, uh, multinational industrials kind of have a layer within their organization where they are, it's sort of like, not a skunk works, but it's almost like a little testing lab of some of these technologies, so it's not interfering with their ongoing operations. They're popping they are, up every. They're popping up everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll look. And this is a public example. Look at Coke Industries. Obviously, a big private company. They have their own KDT group. Their disruptive technologies group. It's pretty. It's quite prevalent. And Drew is spot on. It, the the POV ability to get in, do it, test, put it in the water, and get back out is pretty. It, it's barriers are pretty low, and risk is pretty low now. Given you're not having to go all in with the big capex to go get it done. So yeah. we're definitely in a different world than we were 10 or 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, another one is BASF. Uh, they, they, I know they have an innovation center in yeah. Sunnyvale that is designed to just figure out which companies they should be partnering with. And, and maybe it turns in, into an investment that, you know, even if it may not even benefit their supply chain, but they may realize the value that it has for other companies. So it's what you're realizing too, I, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, carrier groups um, are also kind of building their own 
Yep. You're seeing on both sides, you're seeing it both on the shipper side, but also on the, uh, the, the what I call the capacity provider side too, which is kind of cool to see it happening on both sides of the platform. It, the innovation thing is very interesting to me because that's, you know, most of the time when we, we sell into an organization, we sell either, you know, sea level or within the supply chain stack. But like kind of our secondary channel is, is through some of these innovation teams, which is fantastic. But it's very interesting to me. It, it feels very, very bifurcated where companies either really embrace their innovation team and every team is constantly like, oh, what kind of new cool stuff can we get? Yeah. Or they look at them like the biggest pains in the ass in the entire company and they want like literally the, like, the fastest way to get in trouble with the actual decision makers is to come from the innovation team. And it's, it seems to be like literally one or two of the two outcomes and that's the only way it's gonna be. I, I just think that's fascinating. So if you're thinking about starting up an innovation team, like make sure you get buy-in, otherwise it's gonna be, it's gonna be a bad time. Get boss hog to buy in. I, it's, it's amazing how, how just clearly different, and he, honestly you can usually tell in the first conversation. They're like, if they're like, oh, we can't wait to bring in the business owners, you're probably in good shape. If it's like, all right, when do we get to meet the business owners? I'm like, oh, we need to figure this out a little bit more. It's like, oh boy, like, what, what's gonna happen here? Yeah. Um, let's just quickly talk about data quality, because I think that's something that gets lost in uh, discussion about all the great tech that's out there. Um, if you put, uh, Tar in a uh, you know high performance sports car, it's not going to run very well. I think you know we all sort of think of data data as the uh, as the fuel for some of these um, technologies that you guys are developing and just that that are already out there. So, what should people in the in the audience you know give them a, something to hang their hat on in terms of uh, sharpening their data quality? What should they be looking out for? What should they be doing? For my view, it's like it's a partner that's working on continuously improving the data quality. I mean, our, our own experience was... Outside partner. Out, well, I both I think internally and, and, and externally. I mean, we've, we've found that Ocean Cargo has a huge data quality problem. I mean, over 30% of all the data is either wrong, inaccurate, we're missing. Uh, we've done a lot to improve that ourselves, but like it, in a lot of ways, it will be a never-ending process. So. There's going to be new gaps that are be, going to be discovered and, and, and new issues that you'll need to address. But how do you either work with you know, an internal team, the external parties? How does everybody work towards like, identifying those issues, correcting them, and then feeding that back into the collective, frankly? That mm -hmm. what we see is a lot of like, well, maybe this one group in a freight forwarder fixes a data problem, yep. but they didn't permeate that to the rest of their organization. So you know, nothing really got solved. Yep. Yeah, and that, that's what we think is the way you really address the data quality problem. Yeah. For, for the most part, the, the data that, that we're collecting is, is data that today our customers don't have. Uh, and so part of you know, our conversations with them is how do we, how do we help you use this data? You know, on a, on, you know, forget the tactical for a minute, but on a strategic planning basis, how do we help you further understand what's, what's going on and, and, and ultimately you know, take that into account? Uh, and, and we're fortunate that, that the vast, vast majority of our data is very clean because it's not collected manually, it's collected from pinging a phone. Uh, and right. so that's, that's a process that usually works pretty well. Um, what, where we run into interesting questions and, and issues with data is, is on, on the, what I would call the inbound side. I don't mean the inbound transportation, I mean the inbound part of the conversation, whereby we're working with a customer or potentially going to work with a customer and they say, all right, well, you know, let's talk about the kind of ROI you can generate. And of course, our first question is, Sure, cool. Give us your data and we'll, you know, we'll see what it says. And that's when you run into some very interesting things. I have seen in my life more shipments move for a dollar or a penny than you can possibly imagine. And it's not because they're moving a dollar or a penny, it's because they have to enter a value and they didn't know, so they keyed in a penny and nobody ever went back and fixed it. Um, and so there are, um, and again, going back, it's, it's very, it's an anal analogous to me to the legacy systems conversation. Like this is just reality and, and it's not bad, it's not good, it's not about value judgment, it just is. And if we want to be a great company and grow at the velocity that we're growing at and continue to increase that, our job is to help companies solve their problems. And, and these are, you know, these are a common problem. And so, it's, you know, again, it's like you said, it's, it's just a reality of life. And you scrub the data, you make some assumptions, you have honest conversations about this is what we know, and this is what we're, we're kind of inferring, but this is a little bit messy. And oh, by the way, it doesn't really matter because what happened in the past is never exactly what's going to happen in the future anyway. So this is all an iterative process. We're going to get to know each other. And, and our commitment to you is we're going to make this work. Uh, and, and ultimately, if we're doing our job correctly, by working with us, your data health 
will improve dramatically because we'll no longer ask humans to key things. We'll let the machines just tell us. And then the humans can, can look at that and make decisions off of it. There you go. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I mean, I, we've got to wrap up here. So I'll just, yeah. I'll, I'm going to make a, a couple comments here that are kind of overarching to everybody here. The, um, I would encourage everybody to embrace change. It kind of starts with a vision and a mission to, to be a bit disruptive to yourself and your organization and, and educate yourself in that same process. And it, again, companies like Crux and Transfix, Six River, they're doing great things. Now is the time when you educate yourself with what they're, trying, what they're accomplishing and some of their use cases that they have. If you don't, you'll die. And it won't be a, a, a slow death, it'll be a, a quick death. And I, I go into places every week and I look at people and say, they're gone in two years. They won't survive. And it's not um, technology taking over the world, maybe to some extent, but understand what's happening, pick and choose where you want to go. If you don't do that, you're in denial. And that's, it's what I call iceberg syndrome, and it's the wrong place to be, and it'll, it'll hurt you and your company. Yep. That's kind of my, my overarching conclusion about how we think about technology and where we're going. Well, yeah, and, and you beat me to the punch, Tommy, because I, my last question before I jump over and see if there's any questions from the audience was uh, the importance of now. What is the importance of now? I, I see a lot of companies understanding the problems ahead, but there's, they're also worried about jumping you know, or, or heading down a path that is not the right path. And so waiting to see if, if you know, kind of hanging back and waiting to see if some other companies do it. But then what is the importance of now? So can well, I, um, yeah, yeah, I want to just like, back up then, Tommy, that so our, we have a young company. We're just three years old. But things are going fast. And last year, when companies would come to, to us, they, they wanted to do pilots. So they wanted to get 10 robots into one DC. And now all of a sudden, how fast can you get me ten thousand? <laughs> almost overnight, yeah. So we like we were talking last year, twenty eighteen. It was kind of like this pilot purgatory in our business. Now, oh yeah, all of a sudden, it's I need to get a hundred. I need to get one hundred and fifty. <laughs> I need them across three DCs. And so, so all of a sudden, it's a good problem to have, but it's still a problem, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's the best problem to have. But like my main point is that if you're not doing something now to back up on what Tommy is saying. Your competitors are doing something. And just like there's four of us up here on stage from small companies who are looking to go after the bigger companies we compete with, right. out in your businesses, there are younger companies as well and fast moving companies who are biting at your ankles. Yep. And I know that they're the types of companies that are coming to us first saying, I got to get 100 robots into this facility. I bet you it's the same with Tommy and Eric and Drew. Like it's, I think it's, it's the time to act. We're not that cool, but yes, yeah. we're. So, I, I, yeah, I, I, I would say just get started, right? I know it can be overwhelming. I mean, supply chain is so vast. I mean, even up here, you've got four different perspectives and, and, and four different things you could do. Just pick one that you think is the highest leverage and just start creating a culture of like experimenting and just try it. And, and I think you'll be surprised at, at the, the degree of impact. And then the second one will be easier because you've already done it and the reality is, the second one can probably talk to the first one and, and, and things can get better very quickly. So I, I would encourage everybody to just try. We're, we're, I, I hate to date you guys. I'll, I'll, get, I'll go with the old guy thing here, but I, I'm kind of retread, meaning I, I have, I've had to reinvent myself personally quite a bit just to kind of go where I'm going now. So I think that the people that wouldn't go to a person like Eric who's got ocean and, and port knowledge, like nobody and probably one of the top guys in the world, you need to lean on people like that to be able to understand because they've been through this. They understand you're not, they're more inside out than outside in. So they kind of have that old perspective going to the newer place, I believe. Great stuff. Uh, we, ha we did have a few questions that came in. Uh, we've got about two and a half minutes. So this is going to be lightning round. Uh, I'll try to get to as many of these as possible. And sorry for not getting to the ones there. There are a bunch of good questions. Um, so. Uh, Last mile, um, I had actually a potpourri of buzzwords to go through, but we, the conversation was so good, we didn't even get to things like blockchain, last mile, um, uh, freight futures. Anyone have any thoughts? Because we have questions on all three of those things. Um, anyone with any thoughts on any of those? I thought I was going to get through a Those are pretty broad topics. Yeah, well, yeah you, may, you may want to pick one. What was that? Those are pretty broad topics. You may want to pick one and yeah, two-minute lightning round well, here. I, what, 
Tommy, what, which of those is most interesting to you? I mean, one of, the one of the reasons why I stayed clear from some of these things is we're talking about leveraging technology that exists now. A lot of these things are, are that's sort of like future of supply chain kind of stuff um, that companies are experimenting with, but it's certainly not at scale. So wh which of those things? I think people, this group probably has a lot of blockchain questions, I believe, yep. but yep. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm gonna do a deferral and say probably Eric and, Fergal and team can, and Drew can comment, but I think the blockchain cloud lo looms out there. Mm -hmm. It's always good to get kind of a synopsis of perspective on what that really means. So okay. I'd say that's probably a good, good topic. Well, I've got to admit, I mean, the blockchain just feels like it, it's the RFID panacea of like the early aughts where, you know, there's certainly some, some strategic value specifically to blockchain, but I mean, it really is lacking tactical and strategic use yet. Yep. And uh, it's just, you know, it might get there. So the, the counter, the quick counterpoint I would say to that is 2018 felt like the year when the hype went past the reality and 2019 seems like things have gone very quiet on the blockchain front. So I'm wondering if there's a little bit of experimentation from enterprise at the enterprise level around what blockchain can actually do and we're not hearing a lot about it. So maybe yeah. That, but I, point taken, Eric. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't disagree. Um, <laughs> so, uh, anyone with thoughts on freight futures? That's uh, that's been a topic that's come up uh, in the first half of this year. Um, you know, I'm going to default to. I'd, def I'd say Drew probably has a great perspective Drew, on I think this. You have, yeah. we, we've talked about this before. Yeah, Drew, you've been sort of. Yeah, no, out, man, well, 14, look, ten 14 seconds 14 left. Seconds. Time to go. Um, <laughs> fourteen seconds. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think. Um, I think that, at least uh, the way I think about truckload transportation, I, I do believe that if you do it properly, um, it is very much commodity-like. Uh, and so therefore, um, financial instruments that, that exist in other commodity markets are, are, are theoretically applicable to our market. And there is obviously great volatility in rates, uh, so the ability to hedge is also interesting. Um, the current iteration of it, uh, is, is, it's interesting to me. Like I, I'll say before this iteration happened, I always envisioned a future where the futures um, were effectively owned in many ways by the big three PLs. Like I, like I could make an argument that our company, though we don't actually sell futures, we sell the equivalent of that because we will give you a guaranteed contracted rate for as long as you want. That in many ways is a future. Um, but the idea of creating a purely financial product on the back end to allow probably mainly 3PLs, but maybe some big shippers to lay some of that risk off uh, is interesting. Um, my, my concern is the nuance of this, right? Like a, a, a bottle of, or excuse me, a, a, a barrel of, you know, Texas light sweet crude is a, is a barrel of Texas light sweet crude, and that is truly a commodity. But in our business, it's kind of a commodity, right? Except at that facility, the driver has to count the cartons, and at that facility, the driver has to unload them, and at that facility, the driver doesn't have to do anything. Um, it's, I think it's gonna be very difficult to get all the, the amount of specificity into a future. Um, and so that's, that's the thing that I think is interesting, but the, the philosophical idea I think is, is great. Um, we have a little bit of a different approach to it, but, yep. but that's great. That's the theme of today, right? Is the more uh, angles you have at something, the more likely you are to find the right one. Yeah, great. Uh, well, we'll leave it at that. We could go on for probably another two hours, but thank you to uh, our panel, uh, Eric, Drew, Fergal, and Tommy. Great stuff. Nice. And thank you for your attention today. I appreciate it. And the great questions. And enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you again to everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Absolutely. Great work.